Okay. Let's do section 103, 105. We'll call it day. Back to Missouri problems. So, what are you supposed to do with the governor, with the leaders? If you're the Saints? Importune. That's right, you should import the You should appeal. And so they did. The governor at the time was a man named Governor Daniel Dunklin. Governor Duncan was appealed to, and he actually agreed to help the Saints. John Coral, who was counselor to Edward Partridge, uh, says this. As the he wrote this letter uh, to Edward Partridge, I believe. He says the governor manifested a willingness to restore us back, and will if we request it. Uh, in February 1834, the governor reiterates this position in a formal reply. He fully acknowledges the Mormons had a right to organize a military body if needed. Indeed, it is your duty to do so, he wrote. Um, and they expected if they organized a military body, then he would help them out when they got to Missouri. That was kind of the understood agreement. Okay? Uh, meanwhile, Parley P. Pratt and Lyman White come from Missouri to Kirtland. They arrive and they seek counsel uh, to know what to do. Uh, does the Lord have anything else for us? And indeed, He did. So section 101 was over there. Section uh, 103 happens right after these two show up in Kirtland. Um, so, here it is. Remember the two questions Joseph had? What were they? Why and when? How? When? How? How, yeah. how, how, how will we get it back? Yeah. So, why did it happen? Uh, and how are we going to get it back? Um, yeah, and we looked at those verses and we looked at all those answers. Awesome. There's an additional insight on why. This one, it's fascinating. And the history and the story that happens after it, oh man. Uh, 103 verses uh, 2 through 4. We, there's one other additional reason why the Lord said, I will, uh, I let them drive you out. <clears throat> Let's look at this. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to start, start in verse 1. Verily I say unto you, my friends, behold, I will give unto you a revelation and commandment that you may know how to act in discharge of your duties concerning the salvation and redemption of your brethren who have been scattered in the land of Zion, being driven and smitten by the hands of my enemies on whom I will pour out my wrath without measure in mine own time. For I have suffered them, the enemies, thus far, that they might fill up the measure of their iniquities, that their cup might be full, and that those who call themselves after my name might be chastened for a little season with a sore and grievous chastisement, because they didn't hearken altogether unto the precepts and commands which I gave them. So verse 4, we already knew that. We didn't know verse 3, right? What's the new insight in verse 3? He's also letting the bad guys, part of the Book of Mormon response to why does God let bad people hurt good people, right? And even that question itself is way too generalized and stereotyped, right? But why does he let innocent people suffer at the hands of those who have problems, right? And part of it is that he allows them to fill up the, the, their cup, fill up the measure of their iniquities. We would say in modern vernacular, give them enough rope to hang themselves, right? Let them become fully accountable. They have agency that God's going to let them use it to the fullest, and then comes His indignation. So He brings us up twice, and I want to talk about the fate of these Missouri persecutors. So here He's kind of general. Uh, he says, I will pour out my wrath without measure in my own due time. But then, by two sections later, section 105, He says, The destroyer have I sent forth to destroy and lay waste my enemies. And not many years hence, ooh, there's a timestamp now, not many years hence they shall not be left to pollute my heritage, the land of Missouri, to blaspheme my name upon the lands I've consecrated for the gathering of my saints. Them's fighting words. Them's uh, words of, of God. It's a promise. It's a prophecy. Is there a promise? What happens? Do we know the aftermath of this? It has to happen in the lifetime of these Missourians. Otherwise, it's a failed prophecy. So those very people who drove the saints out, what happens to them? Uh, well, the story plays out during the Civil War. It's a Kibitech story. In the Kansas-Missouri border, the border wars, one of the most bloody and insane conflicts happened here. 
Um, on the Missouri side was the Bushwhackers. On the Kansas side was the Jayhawkers. Against slavery, for slavery. Um, this borderland became a land of, of conflict. There was a man named William Contrell, I believe his name was, in 1863, who went over the border with his group of bushwhackers and they, they sacked Lawrence. They slaughtered 150 people, burned houses, uh, and just, just annihilated so many people there. Uh, they call that the Lawrence Massacre. You can look it up. And uh, the Lawrence Massacre of the Jayhawkers incited the rage of, the, of the, those in Kansas. Uh, Thomas Ewing, who was the leader of the group here, had some friends who were destroyed in that. And this became personal pretty quick. Here in Missouri, uh, here's all the different counties. There were four counties along the border that he held accountable for this. Vernon County, Bates County, Cass County, and Jackson County. Uh, after this happened, he issued order number 11. Order number 11 uh, was to totally depopulate these four counties. Get them out of the way, not necessarily to kill them, but to drive them out. Um, and so as they moved in across the border to Jackson County, uh, they saw uh, the, the hell and the rage of, of the Jayhawkers. Uh, they took that, that occasion to vent their hatred on them because now they were legally authorized under number, order number 11 to get them out of there, and they did not spare. Uh, what happened to them was worse than what they did to the Latter-day Saints. Uh, here's some witness, a witness statement. George Miller. The Lawrence raid was followed by swift and cruel retribution. The Kansas troops visited dire vengeance on all western Missouri. Unarmed old men and boys were accused and shot down. Homes uh, with their now meager comforts were burned. Helpless women and children turned out with no provisions for the approaching winter. Does this all sound familiar? The number of those killed was never reported as they were scattered all over western Missouri. Order number 11 virtually depopulated the eastern and southern half of Jackson and all of Cass and Bates counties. It's this particularly that eastern part. Uh, or, or that southern and eastern part, yeah. yeah that's, that's where these guys were. The enforcement of such an order under the military lash right at the beginnings of winter inflicted untold suffering on thousands of helpless women and children already bearing crushing burdens. The edict was issued and left a once beautiful country a scene of utter desolation, with only here and there a lonely chimney standing to remind one that it had ever been inhabited. Men were constantly being taken out of the prison in the dead hours of the night and never heard of again. Many of them were put out of ways so secretly that their relatives never knew how or where, but only that they never came home again. Human bones and unknowable graves were found in out-of-the-way places for two or three years after the war closed. Sometimes a bleached skeleton still dangled from a tree in some dark timbered dell, God only knowing the doers of the deed. Not many years hence, they shall not be left to pollute my heritage. So that's pretty intense. Before that happened, Joseph made another prophecy. He was sweating when he said that Oliver B. Huntington, this is when they're in Nauvoo, he recorded, he says, he says, uh, Joseph prophesied about the fate of the Missourians for the wrongs inflicted and for the blood of the saints they had shed. He says, she, meaning Missouri, shall drink out of the same cup, the same bitter dregs we have drunk, poured out, 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 and that by the hand of an enemy, a race meaner than themselves. All the time he was delivering the word of the Lord, his face shone as if there was a light within him and his flesh was translucent. When he's done, he gets a rag and he's like, <sighs> so he wipes it off. He's like, I have no idea who that, that race is going to be that's meaner than them, but mark my words. Whoa. I believe there's been a prophet among us. Uh, the Lord gives them a chance back in section 101. He says there is, even now, uh, already in store sufficient, yea, even in abundance, to redeem Zion and establish her waste places, no more to be thrown down. Were the churches who call themselves after my name willing, 
willing to hearken unto my voice. Uh, but that we did not have in great abundance. We had the means, but not the willingness. So, uh, oh. I, I, I make for my students, I make a fake uh, letter from the First Presidency talking about the saints in Juarez, Mexico that are being kicked out. And did you guys hear about the First Presidency? That they asked us to like, go help them out. Like, you guys, uh, your bishop, I'm sure they announced that on Sunday, didn't they? <laughs> no, what? what, what? It's like, yeah! Like, we got, we got it. We're supposed to, we're supposed to meet at the conference center, and then we're gonna like go down. We're gonna like help them out. <laughs> like, no, just kidding. Like, uh, like, like, oh, come on, what we're just like, I know. But what if, right? And then, <laughs> then we would talk about uh, section 103. What's the Lord's counsel on section section 103 about this? That's exactly what He says to do, right? Uh, he says, what verses should we do on this one? Um, He's going to ask them to gather. Where are we going? Help me find those verses where he calls Zion's camp to do so. And then to uh, mark those out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. If you look at verse 22, yeah, that's, that's the right place. Uh, verse 22, let my servant Joseph say unto the strength of my house, young man, middle-aged, gather yourselves together to the land of Zion, the land that you bought with money. It's been consecrated. Let all the church send up wise men and their monies and purchase lands as I have commanded them. Uh, inasmuch as my enemies come against you to drive you from my goodly land, uh, he says, you shall curse them. And whoever you curse, I will curse, verse 25. You will avenge my enemies. Uh, and verse 27, if you need to lay down your life for my sake, don't worry, you'll find it again. And if you're not willing to lay down your life for my sake, you are not my disciple. Um, so pretty strong words. Parley P. Pratt and Lyman White are commanded in verse 30 to not return to the land of Missouri yet until they have gone out around and found uh, organized companies to go down to Zion. If, if you can, let's let's get uh, groups of tens, twenties, and fifties. Uh, even five hundred of the strength of my house would be good. This is my will. But if you can't get five hundred, verse thirty-three, then get three hundred. Yeah. Uh, well, at least uh, yeah, at least thirty, three hundred and thirty-two, and then verse thirty-three. And if you can't get three hundred, then get one hundred. One hundred. There you go. And do not go up unless you have at least a hundred. That's thirty-four. Okay. But I'd like five hundred. So here's the recruiting mission. Joseph Smith Papers has shown us. The, uh, they went all over the place in this region to find as many people as they could, members of the church, to help out. Uh, to either A, send money, or B, actually join the camp, march with them, and help redeem Zion. Right. Uh, and so, yeah. Um, as far as laying down your life, Wilford Woodruff reports this. He says, this is when he was... Uh, as he's settling his business affairs and preparing to join Zion's camp, his friends and neighbors warned him not to undertake such a hazardous journey. They counseled, do not go. If you do, you will lose your life. He replied, if I knew that I should have a ball put through my heart the first step I took in the state of Missouri, I would go. That's called a disciple, according to verse 28, right? Being willing to lay down your life. Um, now, Zion's camp will actually leave in May. They'll have a little over, what, 200 people? That's 200, 200 and something is what they actually get. Um, they begin their march May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. And they begin marching. As they march, they march from Kirtland, the main camp at least, down uh, through Ohio, Indiana, Springfield, Illinois, and they meet another group that Hiram uh, helped to organize from Michigan that meets them down together in uh, Missouri. I'm not sure what city that is, but that's where they meet. Um, yeah. What else do we need to talk about here? Oh, yeah. When they get into Missouri, into that little spot right by Fishing River, uh, there's that cool story of a church video on that. Uh, Fun to tell that story. Talk about uh, how God protects them from their enemies. Riding up on the horse. Right. 
20 years of Joe Smith. <laughs> right? I'm Joseph. What does he say? Uh, we're going to come in and we're going to kill every last one of you. <laughs> so, so memorable. Great video. If you don't show that, you're not a good seminary teacher. Okay? What's the name of that video? Show? It's called Zion's King. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of cryptically coded like that. So. Yeah. Uh, and it, it talks about this. This uh, it shows this uh, storm of storms raises the river like 30 feet, uh, creating a barrier. Uh, hail comes down, breaks the, the the guns of their enemies. Lightning strikes and kills a few people. Uh, meanwhile, no harm or accident or danger falls upon them. Uh, they're just out in a little abandoned Southern Baptist church, and uh, they're fine. Uh, and uh, Joseph says, God is in this storm. He's fighting our battles. Uh, it was the artillery of heaven, one account says, that was unleashed upon the enemies of the church. So the Lord says, I will fight. I will avenge. Now, here's one example of him doing it. Um, okay, then, um, it's right about here that uh, section 105 is received when uh, these two men come back with bad news. They'd gone further. They'd met with Governor Dunklin, and what did they learn? Governor Dunklin says, "Yeah, so as far as like, you know, helping you out like a military way, like, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. I can't, I can't do that." Um, he says, uh, uh, "In fact, there's not really anything I can do, considering like the volatile situation that you're in. So I apologize." Joseph knew that there was no way they could succeed without the help of the governor. So he asked the Lord what should be done. And section 105 is the result of that. Section 105. What does 105 say? The contents. That's the context. What's the content? What does the Lord tell him? Well... Is Governor Dunklin the only one to blame for the failure of this uh, expedition? The Lord says no. One through nine, uh, the Lord outlines the failure of Zion's camp themselves. He uh, talks again about transgressions of his people. You watch the video or read the history, you, you recognize there was lots of jarrings and contentions and all kinds of problems. Verse three, he says, you still haven't learned to be obedient. You're still full of all manner of evil. You're still not imparting of your substance as become a saints to the poor and the afflicted. This law of consecration is not getting all the way into your hearts, right? You're not united according to the celestial law. Zion cannot be built up except on those laws. So to come here and then to try to free your brethren, but to not be living the law, it's going to backfire. It's not going to work. My people must needs be chastened until they learn obedience. They're not all under this condemnation. Again, thankfully, verse 7, not everybody. But uh, it's verse 9, in consequence of the transgressions of my people, it is expedient in me that my elders should wait for a little season for the redemption of Zion. A little season. So they can be prepared, verse 10, taught more perfectly, so they can know more perfectly concerning their duty. Learn to consecrate and live the law of celestial kingdom. Verse 11 talks about the endowment of power on, of, uh, from on high, etc. Um, that awaits them back in Kirtland. So wait a little season, verse 13. Little season for the redemption of Zion. Time to go back. Time to go back. Verse 15 is the prophecy that not many years hence these people will not pollute my land. I will fight the battle. So, was Zion's camp a failure? Is always the question of, uh, of this historical moment. Elder Oak says, yep. According to its ostensible purpose, Zion's camp was a failure. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, but, and there's always, we always have this nice, like, but, right? Like, good things came out. Uh, most of the men who were to lead the church for the next half century included those who would take the saints across the plains, colonize the Intermountain West. They came to know the Prophet Joseph and received their formative leadership training in the march of Zion's camp. Uh, kind of in connection with... Uh, Verse 3 about you've not learned to be obedient. Uh, Levi Hancock, he said, that Joseph said, 
We have to unlearn what we have learned from the world. What a cool principle for not just that it's camp, but for most all of us here. We have to unlearn what we have learned so we can learn to do things the, the Lord's way. Uh, Brigham Young, someone asked him, Brother Brigham, what do you gain by this journey? What does he say? <laughs> just what we went for. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I told those brethren that I was well paid, paid with heavy interest. Yea, that my cup was filled to overflowing with the knowledge that I had received by traveling with the prophet. It was not a waste for Brigham Young. Uh, probably the most important pupil on that trip, right? As he would take the saints on an even uh, further journey. Well, actually about the same. I feel like it's within a few hundred miles difference of uh, Nauvoo to Salt Lake. Is that true? Someone can fact check that. Uh, Joseph says, Brethren, some of you are angry with me because you did not fight in Missouri. But let me tell you, God did not want you to fight. This whole time we thought he wanted to fight. We thought section 103 said, go and fight. We thought he said, avenge your enemies. We thought he said, you're going to fight and I'll fight with you. Curse your enemies. And he's like, turns out the Lord doesn't want you to fight. Maybe the Lord actually didn't want him to fight, but when he saw the condition they were in by section 105, he's like, you're not ready to fight and I'm not going to back you up because you're full of iniquity, so I can't help you. So in that way, that statement would be true. He could not organize his kingdom with 12 men to open the gospel door to the nations of the earth and with 70 men under their direction to follow in their tracks unless he took them from a body of men who had offered their lives, who had made as great a sacrifice as did Abraham. Now the Lord is God is 12 and his 70. There will be other quorums of 70s called. So uh, that's going to happen a little less than a year hence. The quorum of the 12 will be officially organized in February. This is June. And so... Uh, and they'll be taking most of them from that group that traveled to science camp. Uh, to the faithful who did not transgress but didn't get to fight and didn't see Zion redeemed, he has these words of consolation. He says, Inasmuch as there are those who have hearkened to my words, I have prepared a blessing and an endowment for them if they continue faithful. I have heard their prayers and will accept their offerings. It is expedient in me that they should be brought thus far for a trial of their faith. Sometimes the disobedience of others causes us to not receive blessings, which then becomes a trial of our faith. What's the one test we're being tested on? If we'll keep. Will you still keep the commandments, yeah. even when you're in ironic situations like that? Uh, you've been the good guy. You've been faithful. You've been the older brother and the prodigal son. And uh, just keep the commandments. That's still the, That's still it. Uh, it might be fun to go into some Zion's Camp Today stuff. Elder Bednar teaches some stuff about this. Do you want to hear it? Yeah. All right, Elder Bednar. Um, I share this with my students. He says, As individuals. He says it kind of loud sometimes, so yeah, lower that down. He said, As individuals and in our families, we too will be tested, sifted, and prepared, as were the members of Zion's Camp. The scriptures and the declarations of the apostles and prophets do not indicate that faithful members of the church will have trials and tests removed from their lives. Uh, there's only one test, but it will happen in a lot of different ways. The Lord needs some leaders. In fact, Elder Ballard is inspiring to see him say to a group of uh, young adults, he said this, by 2040, just 30 years from now, the number of stakes will have doubled to approximately 6,000. You will be in your late 40s and early 50s. Now ask yourselves, where are the 6,000 stake presidents? Where are their first counselors and second counselors and executive secretaries, clerks? Where are the 6,000 times 12 or 72,000 high counselors? Suppose that every stake has an average of 10 units, about the average of stakes today. Where are the 60,000 bishops? First counselors, second counselors, executive secretaries, clerks, elders, born presidents, and their counselors, high priest group leaders, uh, and their assistants, Relief Society, young women, primary presidents, counselors, and on and on. Where are they? I'm speaking to them right now. It's awesome. Cool. This is 2010. You are they. Will you be ready to accept the callings the Lord will extend to you? Do not let one day go by when you do not strive to be ready to serve. Awesome. Awesome takeaway, awesome application. Uh, how will future leaders of the church be sifted, tried, and tested? What is their test? What's being tested? 
uh, then back to President Iron. Cool. Back to President Iron. And then uh, one final follow up with Elder Bender. My brothers and sisters, consider that affluence, prosperity, and ease can be a test in our day equal to or greater in intensity than the persecution and physical hardships endured by the saints who volunteered to march in Zion's camp. of all tests is the test of no tests. I like it. Which test is harder? Prison cell or unlimited cell service? <laughs> March with blistered feet a thousand miles to Missouri or walk across the street once a month and do your own business and teach. Being tired and feathered for being a Mormon or keeping your thoughts clean on the internet? Being tied to a tree and being whipped for your beliefs or always remembering the Savior while having TV, YouTube, and Facebook in your life. Following the prophet to redeem Zion or following the prophet's counsel to redeem your own dead ancestors. Using high-speed internet on your laptop in your living room. Uh, building the Kirtland Temple in your poverty or regularly attending one of ten temples within an hour drive from here. Which one's harder? Zion's camp is still underway. In that way, what's being tested is the same. Um, I like uh, the Lord's words about how victory comes to pass. All victory and glory is brought to pass unto you through your diligence, your faithfulness, and your prayers of faith. Whatever your test is, whatever your trial is, whatever particular way you're being tested now, uh, there is a recipe for success. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.